Too many of us have lumpy gravy, thin soups, flatbreads, and hockey puck biscuits because we don't understand wheat flour. Come spend a few minutes with me and you will see wheat flour in a whole new light. Flour is amazing stuff. With just a little discussion about the chemistry of flour, we can be much more confident in the kitchen. Wheat is called a staff of life for good reason. It is filled with highly digestible starch, a reasonable amount of protein, and a fair amount of micronutrients. And it tastes good. Breads, cakes, cookies, gravy, soups, breakfast cereal. So many of our favorite foods contain flour. Flour has two major structural components, starch and protein. We must first consider this fundamental chemical truth. Starch and protein react quite differently. Water influences starch, whereas protein is affected by fat. Knowing when to dissolve the starch or shorten protein is critical. Now, just to be scientifically accurate, native starch is not soluble, so it doesn't actually dissolve in it. It leaches away from the protein, but for our purposes, dissolve is descriptive of what we are doing in the kitchen to thicken soups, sauces, and gravies. And besides, the word leach has a very negative connotation for me. I don't want those blood-sucking creatures in my kitchen. The starch in flour is actually what thickens the liquid. As it gets hot, especially after the boiling point, it gelatinizes and holds the liquid in suspense. The key to not having lumps is to separate the starch molecules when it hits the hot liquid. Let's go to the kitchen where we will make gravy by first leaching starch with cold water. Then we will make gravy by separating the starch and protein molecules with fat. We are in the kitchen here to discuss flour. There are two major structural components of flour. One is starch and the other is protein. It's primarily starch, however, there can be somewhere between 7 and 16 percent protein, depending on how they raise the wheat. Uh, All-purpose flour is a mixture of both soft and hard wheats, uh, and so gives us a percentage mostly somewhere in between around 9 to 10 percent, um, depending on the manufacturer. Now, when the starch is dissolved in either fats or cold liquids, and then heated, the starch cooks, and as it cooks, it gelatinizes. And it's that process of gelatinization that makes the food product thick. Now, uh, the first way I was talking about is what's called a slurry. Now, a slurry is cold liquid, typically water. And what we're going to do is mix this. And for this to not have any lumps, we need to make absolutely sure that there's no lumps to begin with. If the starch is not suspended or leached out from the protein itself, any of those lumps are going to end up cooking just as lumps and give us a lumpy gravy. Now, this is kind of a hack, and I'm kind of a no-hack person. However, because I already have this in a jar, I'm going to take it and shake it. And this is a very effective and efficient way of making sure that I don't have any lumps. That's what we have called a slurry, where the starch is actually just leached separate from the protein using a cold liquid. Uh, the second principle is by using fat. And what happens is, is that the starch molecules are separated from the protein, just like in the slurry, but they're separated by using fat. And that by using fat, we're separating the gluten or the wheat protein from the starch so that we don't have those lumps, but in a different method. White roux using butter, and we're using equal parts and making this a smooth paste. Maybe just a little bit more flour here. By making a smooth roux, this also gives us the opportunity of having a smooth sauce. Now, if you can see there's still lumps here, the same principle applies. We haven't separated the protein and the starch yet, and so any of these lumps will transfer into lumps in our sauces or gravies. So I need to mix this well, and now I have roux. I'm going to get a couple of pans of stock ready, and I will be back. We're ready to thicken some sauce. I have made some chicken broth um, <clears throat> and 
I am going to shake the slurry once again. Now, with slurry, we still need to keep the hot liquid moving and pour this in rather slow. We need to keep the, the product moving, I guess is a better way to put it. <clears throat> and I'll be doing that with using a, a flat whisk. And one of the advantages of using a slurry is that it thickens very, very quick. And so we know how much to put in by watching it, how thick it becomes. Now, because there is cold liquid here, we need to be careful and wait for this to return to temperature before we add any more. If you get too much, yes, you could add some more plain broth, perhaps some cream or something to not neutralize the flavor. Um, but we'll watch this for a little bit and make sure that it gets to the thickness that we want. I want this thick, but not over thick because I'm making a sauce, not a gravy. Um, with it, with the roux, we can add more <coughs> uh, to begin with without having to stir it because what happens is is the fat actually encapsulates the the protein and so the protein and the starch uh, don't mix together and so you won't get the lumps that you would with the slurry i'm going to put about half of this in and as you can see even though there's a pile there as I stir that, the fat melts quickly and I have a nice smooth sauce still. This is coming back to, to boil. Typically before you want to add any more slurry, you want this to boil for just about 60 seconds. Um, I can tell just from some experience that I want a little bit more and bring that up to temperature and that will be done. Now there's some advantages and disadvantages with both styles. First of all, the slurry is slightly more clear you may see. Now this is a heavy stock and so there's certainly some color but with the slurry it's a little more translucent whereas with the, the roux it's more opaque. Now one of the other advantages or disadvantages, depending on what you want, is you're not adding any extra fat with the slurry. Um, so the calories is only the amount of starch that you've added because of the slurry. Whereas with the, the roux, we're obviously adding more calories because of the fat. One of the advantages or disadvantages again, or differences is, is all I like to call it. <clears throat> the difference is, is that this doesn't have any added flavor from the fat. So if you need a pure flavor without covering or masking, uh, something that's a lighter, like perhaps an oriental dish, you would use the slurry um, because it's not going to mask the flavor. Whereas if you're making something like biscuits and gravy or something where you want to add that extra flavor, then the roux is the way to go. Um, so less calories, more translucent, no extra flavors, a very clean flavor. Whereas with the roux, it's opaque, has added calories, but it also has added flavor because of the type of fat that you choose. White roux is made with butter, as we say, but there's plenty of other roux out there. Dark roux, brown roux, roux made with bacon fats or sausage drippings. Um, it still is the same principle, adding flour and fat together to make a sauce or gravy. And there we have it. Thank you for being with us here in the kitchen. We have just learned a little bit about flour and its chemical properties, how the starch and protein have different properties, and how to use these principles in making better sauces, gravies, and soups. Watch Quick Breads next to expand your use of flour. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video to not miss these Kitchen Science and Common Sense productions. Good day.